Hello, today I'll be unboxing and talking about a WatchGuard Firebox M390. And stay till the end, you'll get to hear about the capability of this box. And of course, you'll get my comments on it as we go along. Now, we've actually unboxed other WatchGuard products before. They're pretty much a go-to product for me. They're very stable. They're very you know, durable. They've worked in all kinds of environments with no problems. Of course, not saying put them out in you know, <laughs> very humid spaces or very dusty spaces necessarily. But I'm just saying I've never had one break on me. I've never had issues with uh, firmware upgrades. Uh, yes, there was a little uh, you know, incident in the past with them. They reacted very well to it. Immediately, they you know, patched up their firmware. They warned everybody about the Cyclops virus that they're rather security vulnerability that they had. So the point is, is they do seem to react quite well. Uh, over time, I found that the service and support has degraded somewhat. However, since there's rarely any, uh, you know, thing that goes wrong with these, it's, it's a pretty solid buy in my case, and I certainly still recommend them. So let's go ahead and open this. Now this is meant for an SMB, so if you're smaller environment, medium sized environment, this is a rack mount. It's not the lowest version, it's one step up. You can go with the M290, this is the 390. So let's go ahead and open it and let's talk about what it looks like. Now if you like these videos, please give us a thumbs up and of course subscribe, that really helps us out, especially a small channel like ours. The algorithms love you if you do that and we certainly appreciate it. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at what's in here. So this will actually be the accessories. As you can guess, the accessories really boil down to uh, some wires. So you can plug them. You've got North American wire and you've got some European ones. So not much in here. And I believe that that's it. There's a little booklet in here as well, which is really a quick setup guide for you. Now, you're probably not going to need the quick setup guide, but in case you do, it's there. Let's take a quick look. Now, you'll notice these still come in red. The color they come in, the only color you can get. And let's actually go ahead and open up the plastic completely. It's just a piece of tape here, so it's quite simple to open. These, of course, are made of metal, all of them. And Considering how much they cost, they're not made cheap. So you'll notice they're pretty hardy. Now what you've got in the front, really this a glorified switch <laughs> with a lot of extra oomph processor memory and so forth in there so that it can process. Now, so what you're gonna find really are the eight ports in the front, those are gigabit. So again, nothing really special, but you can do is you can go ahead and you can add some modules in here. So if you had, for example, SFP plus that you wanted to add. I don't know if you want to go with 2.5 uh, gigabit per second uh, card, you know, connections with some other switches you might have that are faster. You can go ahead and add those to the to them. Of course, if you want to do fiber and so forth, you can do that. Now in the back, take a quick look. You've got basically your power, you've got multiple fans, and you do have, I'm going to call it an on switch as opposed to an on off switch because really it's locked in the on position. It's really more of a reset. So in case you need to power it off temporarily, the, the idea is that these should always be on. And of course, there's no reason for it to be really turned off at any time. I've never had to do it. There is a reset switch here. Apart from that, you've got a couple lights, but really these are managed remotely. So let's talk about management. Let's talk about what you can do. Now, originally, these really provided two means of management, as I've shown in some of my videos, and those namely are a web interface, which you could go if you're in a local environment, go and connect to them. And afterwards, you could also use, there's some something called WSM. So basically, it's, it's a management application you can download. And at that point, if you wanted to manage it remotely, you would have to have a static IP address basically because you do have to define a policy on here that would say, hey, I allow you to get managed from this address. It would only accept it from that address. So it's very secure, probably a good way of doing it if you want to go down that path. Now talking about management and so forth, there is obviously some reporting that you can show using the web interface. You've got some graphics in there, it looks pretty. There's also a virtual machine that you can download directly from WatchGuard and you can run it in your, let's say, VMware environment. 
Uh, I've done some videos on that as well. So if you need to set that up, it's quite easy. Basically, you download this. It's called Dimensions, and it will actually get the log information and you know keep it longer and be able to produce some executive reports, for example, give you a you know, map of the world. It'll show you a little bit where things are being, you know, coming in from an attack point of view and so forth. So when you purchase these, you have a few options. You can decide the level of protection that you want. So you've got, you know, from the more basic to the more complete. And the total security is the one that I usually recommend. It comes with all the bells and whistles. And what you'll find there are not only you know, as you'd expect an antivirus, but if you get the toll, you actually get like a gateway AV. So you got like a secondary AV that's running as well. They'll do things like sandboxing. There's a web blocker on here. There's a, I'm trying to remember what else we've got. There's also the, there's an APT blocker. There's IPS, which is basically intrusion prevention. It will do things like track botnet servers. So be able to tell if you're transmitting to them or getting, you know, information from them or most likely attacks from them or, or something like that. You know, denial attacks, those types of things will be handled by this box. Now, in general, and I'm talking to maybe the people who are less familiar with firewalls in general, the whole point is to have the, the person or the system that is trying to intrude into your environment end up on this box and it will take the blunt, you know, the force of the attack as opposed to your internal systems because the Sure, nobody does this anymore. But in the old days, you had a Windows 2000 server or something like that, and you'd have IIS running. You'd plug it in, and and you know you'd make it available. And all of a sudden, your port 80 goes to an internal server. And as time went by, obviously things got out of hand. People were trying to attack these, and it just so your your servers either would be you know spending a lot of their CPU cycles trying to log in pe people with wrong names and passwords and so forth and they could get out of hand and so with this you've got a self-contained environment that really analyzes the packets that come in a will and of course the whole point is to try to minimize your footprint on the internet so most most or all the ports are closed to begin with and then you'll reopen the ports that you need so if you need to let in a port 80 to go into something internal you could do that uh, what's really nice is you've got extra features which you would expect now such as uh, you know geolocation so for example I could say I want to give access to a web portal an internal maybe you got a system that runs I don't know the AC or something internally and it's vital to your business well you may want to be able to monitor it so you could monitor it by again by IP address you could also say I only want the following country or countries to have access to this port so you can mix and match and of course configure it the way you need it for your environment you can of course create multiple users on here you can integrate it into other you know systems and so forth i mean you've got some rmm systems some mdr systems out there that will i guess depends on your environment but you can have various security services that you subscribe to that could go and talk to not just to watch guards, this applies to a whole lot of other brands as well, but they could talk to them and get the information. Now back to the management, there's also a cloud aspect to it if you want now. So if you wanted, uh, you could do all of your management through their cloud portal. So you have the web, that was the original one. And then you've got the, uh, the WSM, as I've mentioned, which is basically an application you put in. And then there's the cloud and all of these will provide you, on top of the Dimension server that I mentioned as well, will provide you with decent reporting. You'll be able to see things going in and out. You can automate it, of course, to go and get its updates on a regular basis. So it, it will pull back to the mothership back at WatchGuard, make sure that all the virus definitions and all the services, the botnet IP addresses and all those things get updated on an ongoing basis so that they don't get stale and so that you're uh, you know tip top shape and things just really is there prepared for the enemy and it's there to uh, you know fend off any potential attacks that you might get there's the other thing is you when you get to the higher ends they have been increasing their portfolio i know that they purchased uh, panda for example an antivirus uh, so they're now offering certain services such as edr so basically you'll be able to monitor the endpoints back through 
their portal, you know, things like that. There's reputation and enable defenses. I'm trying to think what else there is on here. Really, uh, if you're going to this level, so this, for example, will allow uh, 250 mobile VPN connections. And of course you could, if you've got a whole lot of offices, if you're doing basically watch guard to watch guard, you're doing from office to office, well, you'd also have that limit with this model. So if you go down to the 290, for example, it goes from, you know, the 250 to, oh, I forgot now if it's 175 or 150, something like that. Look that one up, please, or I'll write it below. But the point is, is as you go down and then you get, especially into the smaller ones that I've uh, reviewed in other videos, uh, which are really more for, you know, very small branch office, perhaps, or for the home users, when you're going down into the, you know, the, well, I'm not going to say all the models, but the point is, is they have more uh, the table size, the tabletop size watch guards, which are really meant more for the home users and so forth. So these you could easily see fits very nicely into a rack. So there's some ears in there, like I call them little brackets that you can put in and simply slide that in. And at the end of the day, you've got something here that will last you. Obviously, I, you know, when you buy equipment like this, you have to keep in mind that because, you know, evolve, things evolve and so forth. So you want to keep refreshing these probably every three years is what I try to do. So I get the service for three years when it expires. I, there's a trade-in program at WatchGuard. So other brands have this as well. So it's not unique to WatchGuard, but they will you know, trade it in for a decent price. And if you'll notice when you actually want to, let's say, just add years to the service, sometimes it's not a whole lot more to get a brand new unit and just swap it out. Now, changing units, I wasn't going to get into this, but why not? What you Basically, you do is you back up the configuration from the old one because if you think about it you've had to define the ports so your one you could have multiple isps for example and so once you've configured all that and especially if you've created a lot of users or if you've integrated things you don't want to have to redo that every time you switch boxes so it's nice as you can back up the configuration bring you back on this one as soon as you turn it back on everything's configured same port, same everything, assuming it's a similar product that has the same you know, number of ports and so forth. So that's about it in a nutshell. Leave some comments below. I love hearing what, you know, what kind of environments you put these in, why you picked WatchGuard, what you like, dislike. I'm going to tell you right off the bat, one of the things that I do not like is the fact that the multi-factor authentication from WatchGuard, you have to get their product. Not that it's bad, it's just that I have spoken to a lot of CEOs and so forth and they standardize on let's say you know Google Authenticator or something like that and they really want to stick to a single MF you know MFA basically you know something on their <laughs> phone like you know like I said Google or Microsoft but they'll standardize on one and they don't want to have one for the watch guard one for you know something else and so I know that that's been brought to my attention a few times in private that like well I really don't like that aspect but it's uh, kind of minor in the grand scheme of things, depending on your environments. I, again, a lot of uh, environments now, because everything's cloud-based, there's less and less VPN use, and certainly there's less and less you know, things that need to go back into the head office. So usually if you've got external offices, you simply reconnect you know, point to point, and you'll just be able to, uh, to seamlessly go to another office and you know, see your servers that were back at the head office in a, a decent and easy way. One of the important considerations in a firewall is how to size it. You don't want to buy something that is too big, too powerful for what you really need because you're just paying extra money. It's going to sit there and in three years, you're probably going to discard it and start it all over again. Now, what are some of the things you're going to look at to size it? Things like how many connections it could have, things by how many VPN connections it can have simultaneously. So for example, this one here can have 250 VPN connections that's mobile to, uh, mobile to this box. Now keep in mind also if you're going to have multiple branches or multiple other offices, then that is also limited to 250. So you probably don't want to max necessarily out the system 
depending on what kind of traffic's coming in. If you've got a user and locationally they're clicking on something and getting a file, a small file and something, it's very different than if you have an environment where they're getting videos to edit them or, or you know those sort of things. So keep all of that in mind. Now, having talked about getting files and videos and whatnot, the other thing is since we're pushing more and more of our resources out to the cloud. In fact, I know a lot of companies that have pushed everything off to the cloud. Well, in this case, there's very little traffic that comes in. Maybe VPN's not so important anymore. Maybe it was back then and you had legacy applications running on servers and whatnot. Those are all slowly going away. Now, I mention this because the limit really has to do with what the box does. So let me give you an example. When you're talking about, they call it UTM full. So basically, using a lot of the services, they're rating this at 2.4 gigabits per second. Now, if you're talking about VPN specifically, that's 1.8 gigabit per second. That's what it can handle. That's the speed you're expecting. Things, if you've got HTTPS content, for example, a lot of browsing, a lot of connecting to cloud services and so forth, uh, that's 1.32 gigabits per second. So if you think about it, that, you know, put that in your head is how you're going to configure your front ports. Maybe you have multiple ISPs, internet service providers, that bring you the internet. And you can split traffic. You can use a secondary one as a, a fallback. So if one you know, suddenly has no communications, it falls to the other one and so forth. So you can program this for stability, for speed, for reliability. You get to pick. It's really like a huge Lego set. Now you can set policies and your heart's desire and go to lunch. So... Excuse me. And uh, the other things that it does is like antivirus, for example, there's a certain limit that's 3.1 gigabits per second. IPS is 3.3. And if you look at, you know, APT and the rest of those, they all have, they all have a, a speed and you want to scale it. And you'll just go take a look at the specifications for the models and usually they put them side by side. So WatchGuard's great at that. They will give you all the tabletops, which are more meant for the remote users, the home users, perhaps a very, very small office, remote satellite office, for example, if you're in the, on a real estate and there's like a three person team somewhere out in a small office, then you could connect one of those back to this one and they would have access to the internal systems. Maybe you've got, you know, legacy CRM or, you know, those types of systems. So that's about it in a nutshell. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I'm Bob Pellowin, of course. Please leave some comments below. I love reading those, and I certainly enjoy hearing about how you're using the, these in the field, uh, what you like or dislike. And of course, if you have comments for other videos. I'd love to hear you know, your thoughts or your comments on those as well. So you could also look me up on Amazon.com. You'll see that I've written a book. Just look up for Bob Pellowin. I wrote a book on basically business applications for artificial intelligence, if you're into that sort of thing. And of course, you could always visit us at www.ctobob.com where I try to post uh, blogs occasionally. So thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video.